Well, good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Wim Bauman, and I'm not a food scientist. My real expertise is into uh, neutron scattering. And I had the big pleasure to work the last four years together with Bai Tian. And she's educated in uh, Beijing, thereafter in Wageningen University, as a food scientist. And we've had a beautiful collaboration. And for that reason, uh, she got awarded her PhD last year. And we worked on the structure of meat analogs uh, using neutron scattering. And well, uh, there have been quite some presentations before why people work on uh, uh, meat analogs. Uh, it's really now hard <laughs> necessary. And why we have to do food research for this is also clear and has been mentioned by most of the speakers before me. And we uh, worked on a special kind of sample uh, that was, it's kind of a model system. If you have calcium caseinates, then sometimes they can form really nice fibers. And the reason to work on it with shear is that you can make really huge pieces of a meat analog. The real purpose is to make something that's really representing a steak. And uh, you know, sometimes you get a good texture, really nice fibrous texture. And what we want to know uh, with Wageningen first tip is what are the principles behind it? How can you steer it? How can you control it? And we had three questions that we want to answer. Uh, and one of them was, what is the effect of the mobility of the proteins during the processing on the kind of fiber structure you can get? It turns out that some of the calcium caseinates, uh, they really form nice fiber structures that are the sprayed right ones. But if you roller dry them, then they're not that coherent. And the texture is not that good and it's not perceived that good by consumers. So we want to know what is the reason that you get these different results. Uh, we did measurements, we did inelastic neutron scattering measurements and there we prepared samples in different manners, in different environments uh, with D2O and with H2O. And we put them in a container just like this. And then we went to England, to ISIS, where you have a big neutron facility. Uh, it's a similar type as the ESS, but then uh, with some different properties. And there they got an inelastic neutron spectrometer. And what you basically do is that you have neutrons coming from here, falling on your sample. And it's a time of flight mechanism. So you know exactly uh, the energy of the neutrons. The neutrons get reflected on the sample. Then they go to monochromators, to detectors, and then you know again exactly the wavelength and the energy of the neutrons. And if there's now a difference between the initial energy and the final energy, then you know that it's due to the collision with the molecules, with the proteins. If the proteins are moving, then they give energy to the neutron or they can absorb energy. And measurements look typically like this. Here you see the energy transfer of the neutrons when they scatter from the proteins. Here you see one of the cases, this was a roller dried, uh, dry protein at a slightly higher temperature, uh, 340 Kelvin. Now, if you look at this peak, most of the scattering is elastic, but you see these wings. And in the wings is the information about the mobility of the protein. Part of it, here, this black curve is the resolution curve. That is the elastic part of the scattering. But then if you want to analyze this peak in detail, then there's one wider peak, which we have associated towards fast movements of the proteins. And then there's more narrow peak where you see that there's less energy in the movement.
and that drum is uh, connected uh, to the more slow movement in the protein. And then in addition, there's a background. And now you have to think what's the meaning of this fast and slow movement. And this is a fit to red curve, this, uh, this model. Now, if you have casein mice cells, they have different proteins inside them and you have parts of them sticking out, the more hydrophilic parts and the more hydrophobic parts on the inside. And then uh, if you have them, the milk powder and you dry it, then they cluster together. And if you hydrate them, then parts of the protein will be more in the more water rich environment. And now we have associated the movement, the slow movement uh, with something like 20 picoseconds with the internal parts of the protein. And then the fast movement uh, that had a width that's associated with movements with time scale of three picoseconds with the external movements of the proteins. This is very typical value people find for proteins in solution. And now if you start to look at what's happening with the different proteins, now if you first take a look at the spray dried ones that are the circles, and the square ones that are the roller dried ones, uh, and we compare them in water and the dried ones, the filled ones are in water, then we see that for the slow movements that you get uh, a bigger amplitude for the spray dried ones than for the roller dried ones. For the dry material, the movement is much less. You see the same effect for the fast movement. The fast movement there, you see also that the spray dried one is uh, having a higher mobility. So we think that this higher mobility is connected to the possibility to get a good uh, texture, fibrous texture. So I think that this is an important way to look further also into the plant uh, proteins when you dare make, try to make these shared textures. So now let's go to the next uh, question. When you share your material, then uh, you get an orientation. But now you start off with isotropic uh, proteins and if they're very small then the forces on them are also small so you don't expect that you get an orientation effect already on the molecular length scales it will happen at longer length scales it will be more on the length scales of aggregates of the proteins but at which length scale does this orientation start what's there important now if you look at uh, the samples, then uh, you can cut out part of the sample. And then uh, you can take a look at the small angle neutron scattering. We've seen many examples already in this uh, workshop. An instrument like this, uh, you put sample in the beam, you look at your scattering pattern. And now if you do this, for our meat analog, then you get an anisotropic scattering pattern. Now you can start to look. Uh, the samples were oriented in a horizontal way. And now if you, it's in reciprocal space. So now you have uh, your sample with the fibers horizontally, and you have a narrow dimension in the vertical direction. And that's where you get the widest peak. And in the length, it's much shorter, and it's due to the length of the fibers. Now, if you start to make sector cuts and look at scattering in the uh, vertical direction and the horizontal one, you can see it here. Then you see that for the large Q factors, the large angles corresponding to the short distances, the scattering is the same. So that shows that at the short length scales, it's still isotropic protein. At the longer length scales, you get the anisotropy. Now, if you look at microscopy, then you can see that you can assign it to kind of cylinder-like objects. 
Now, if you think of these fibers to be composed of spheres corresponding to the isotropic part, and these spheres together constitute cylinder-like bits, then you can start to analyze the measurements. And that are the drawn curves you see here. And the red one, yeah, you cannot see the curve because it's really a perfect fit. And from this fit, you can get the radius of these spheres corresponding with the shoulder here. You can get the uh, diameter of the cylinders corresponding uh, here with uh, this shoulder. And the length is a bit more difficult. That is somewhere here and inside the intensity. And now you can look what's the effect of the shear time on the different parameters you get out of the system. If you look at the spherical parts, then you don't see that much variation. You see that the whole time you get a radius of some 10 nanometers for the completely isotropic part. If you look at these cylinders, then they have a diameter of some 100 nanometers. It's very short shear time. And they become thinner if you shear longer. And if you look at the length of the fibers, which is a bit more difficult to retrieve, then you see that the length is becoming longer. It's going from 200 nanometers up to some 400. So this is telling you also that uh, after 15 minutes, you reach pretty much plateau. What I like is there that you really quantify the structure. And that's, I think, quite unique of scattering methods. Now, we looked also at the effect of the shear rates. You can shear at a low rate or much faster. And there we see a similar effect that the faster you shear, the longer fibers you get. And you see here that we didn't re reach saturation yet. Uh, the machine in Wageningen uh, couldn't go to a faster shear rate. But there you might even get uh, a better texture. So now let's go to the final question that we answered. Uh, this is a little bit of preliminary study. Uh, we looked at if you can quantify the scattering, the number of fibers in air bubbles. Uh, recently found out it's really important to share that you need kind of two-phase system. It can be, for example, if you have uh, air bubbles, then you get more fiber texture. Uh, so air bubbles play a role. And we uh, did their experiments in uh, Delft on the instruments I uh, pitched uh, yesterday. And if you look at normally at uh, refraction, that's happening at very small angles. So with a normal sun's instrument, you will never see it. But with our very high resolution, you can see it also with USANS instruments. And this is another sample. This is uh, earlier work I did. This is really on plant proteins. It's a mixture of lupine and uh, gluten proteins. And here you see the microscopy images. You see the fiber structure. And we put it. And if you now have your fibers, then they will work as lenses. And we did measurements with two different orientations. We did them with one orientation where we were very sensitive to the scattering in one direction. And there, from this measurement, from the very fast decrease, here on the horizontal axis, you see the applied magnetic field. So we cannot directly connect it to anything physically, but it is corresponding uh, to the number of fibers that the neutron needs on its way through the sample. Uh, when we did the other orientation, when the samples were mounted in the direction where it should not be sensitive to refraction, then we had also a signal, but it's much weaker. And that is showing that these uh, fibers are not perfectly oriented. There's a spread in orientation so we get out of this measurement two different numbers. One of them is the number of fibers that we have. It's some 36 fibers 
in a sample thickness of five millimeters. And we see also that the spread and orientation is some 35 degrees. Uh, now, these are things that you can get from microscopy. But now something that has been mentioned a few times in this workshop is that for me, the holy grail would be to try to do something like this in situ. Our measurements are too slow to do this in situ, but I think that it might be possible to do this with uh, USACs, for example, in the future. So the conclusions from the work that uh, by Tian and I did was that uh, protein mobility yields a better texture for your meat analogs. We quantified where you get a fiber structure in these shared uh, systems, and that's happening above length scales of 40 nanometers. And you can quantify uh, fibers and uh, air bubbles using uh, neutron scattering techniques. And I think that real challenges for this field, and I'm thinking now also about these northern lights, that is sample environments very important. And to do in situ measurements, that I think that we can really make big steps uh, for food science. And one of the challenges that uh, we had in the recent years, I've been working now for 15 years with food materials. That's neutron scattering. People are used to work with very nice model systems. But food is very messy, especially if you go to real systems. And it means that you need a completely new way of modeling. And that's where we have contributed a lot. And now I think that if you have more modeling of what's happening with Monte Carlo modeling or let's Boltzmann systems, that you can come up with a more advanced data analysis. So I think that's the real future uh, for the combination of food science and uh, scattering methods. Is that I would like to uh, thank you for your attention.